lecture series. Uh, my name is Nicholas Lambert. I teach the course in conjunction, the R309-105. Uh, but tonight is obviously a public lecture forum, so hopefully there's folks from around the uh, university and, and the city. And this is our second to last uh, lecture for the Arts Now series. Uh, tonight, obviously, we're going to go to the lab, and Nathaniel Stern will introduce him in a second. But our last visiting artist is May 2nd, uh, Beth Lipton. So if you have one of these outdated schedules, one of these uh, one of these handouts, you you you'd probably notice that <laughs> Joseph already presented on March seventh. It's a great time. Thank you for coming back. He was, he was so good, we brought him back. And Hank Will's Thomas is not next week, uh, which is somewhat a huge bummer, disappointment. But supposedly he's coming back in the fall, right? And folks in this class, I've, I've presented work on Hank Will's Thomas, so. Those of you, uh, you know, you should come back to the next call. This is all the more reason. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Nathaniel Stern, who will introduce our guest. Nathaniel Stern, our famous artist from South Africa. Really <laughs> catch up over here. Twice. Twice. <laughs> Twice. Uh, <laughs> um, hey, everybody, how's it going? Good to answer that. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure for me to introduce Joseph DeLapp, professor at the University of Nevada, Reno, and the head of their digital media uh, program. He's been working with New Media since 1983, and although I personally was too young to appreciate it back then, uh, I've been a huge fan of his work for over a decade and following him since I was a graduate student. His work, excuse me, spans sculpture, networked art, prints and drawings, performance, game arts, kinetic installation, and more. Um, it's been featured all across the United States, Australia, the UK, Germany, China, Spain, Belgium. He's given talks at places like the Museum of Modern Art in New York, then featured on CNN, NPR, CBC, and the New York Times, on the Rachel Maddow Show, um, in Art in America, and more. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is that the past day and a half that I've spent with Joseph has been an absolute pleasure and, and really, really wonderful. Watching him uh, interact with students and faculty here has shown me that he is not only an extremely generous thinker, but also a generous teacher. Um, and that makes me like him and his work that much more. So please join me in welcoming Joseph Delap. Days and 
these kind of objects, in, in, and especially in the, these, this era of the Apple Mouse is really interesting because it had a kind of textured surface that looked almost like skin, almost like pores, if you remember. Um, and I, so I started actually reconfiguring desktop computer mice. So these are actually physical models, not uh, digital uh, Photoshop pieces. Um, the vagina mouse, pretty straightforward. Um, connected with this wonderful joystick, which didn't need any uh, alteration to be found. Um, so that's kind of you know a comment there on, on design. So the one on the bottom left is the Unabomber's mouse, and that's the uh, first two lines of Ted Kaczynski's manifesto, actually physically burned into a desktop mouse using uh, metal punches heated with a loaded candle. And, uh, So uh, the one on the bottom right was actually the first one. Uh, that was the heart mouse, uh, which curiously I ended up giving that to my colleague roommate as his wedding present because he and his wife met on the internet. Uh, other objects uh, around this uh, series. Um, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. I went to San Jose State University, and I'm often in the Bay Area visiting family. And that which is amazing surplus stores from Silicon Valley, uh, one in particular called Weird Stuff Warehouse. It's a gigantic Home Depot-sized warehouse full of uh, leftovers from the industry and, and from uh, cubicle culture. And so I would buy literally boxes full of dead computer pieces and take them back to my studio and joysticks, one of uh, my Genesis game controllers. Um, but the, the most probably the most significant piece to come out of this uh, series of working with uh, a desktop computer device was this one. This is my artist mouse from 1998. And this was a, essentially a kind of reverse engineering of an Apple desktop mouse. And um, inspired by actually a, a cartoon that someone had put in the computer laboratory when I was in grad school, and it just sort of always stuck with me. And it basically had a little drawing of a, of a two by four and a pencil equals computer mouse, right? So it's like if you imagine a, a, a pencil through a piece of wood that's like drawing with a mouse, right? And so it just kind of sat with me and I thought, hmm, let's try this. So I made this artist mouse and it was like, well, what am I going to do with it? And, you know, it, it, this was a functional mouse. It was still working. Uh, and so I actually started using this. And about this time, I had just gotten curious about computer games and started playing them just for fun. Um, and one of the first was this was Unreal in 1998, one of the original kind of very popular first-person shooters. And so what I did was I replaced my mouse pad with 10 by 10 inch pieces of uh, Reach BFK uh, paper, use an ebony pencil connected to the uh, artist mouse, and I played levels of the game Unreal. And totally unexpected, really interesting, these little abstract marks that I couldn't make if I tried, you know. And, really intrigued by this. Uh, it, it's a kind of, it's a mapping of that computer time, right? Uh, and you could literally, the, the fact that you could literally trace it backwards and go back through the game really intrigued me. Um, and also the notion of kind of taking, taking the digital and turning it, bringing it back into analog, you know, and, and, and a sort of kind of mixed reality uh, sensibility. Um, these are some other pieces that were made. There's a number that I'm not showing here, but the, the top ones are roughly 30 by 30 inches, and, and each of these represents uh, approximately one month of all of my computer time, and rotating this paper as I went. And so this is like, again, this is kind of like a calendar. It's, again, this sort of mapping of experience, uh, virtual experience. And, and this is doing everything from Grading papers, surfing the internet, uh, playing games, writing memos, I wrote a uh, paper for CAA on the you know, it's like, this is just my life for three months of computer time. Um, the one on the bottom right is, there's a number of those that I did, but this one was done when I was 
department chair of the University of Nevada Reno on my desk as the department chair. And you can see it's very rhythmic and kind of boring and all the same. <coughs> that's the life of a chair. Um, but uh, that, that was a bit larger. Um, now, while you know, engaging in these games and making these, uh, making these drawings, you know, this was the first step into using games for art, right? A, a computer games, this kind of new emerging technology, these 3D immersive environments that you run around these spaces, basically shooting and killing each other. Um, and then, but I was really intrigued once they, once these games migrated to online spaces. Um, uh, the first one I probably played was probably Quake. Uh, in that context, but I was really, I found myself really entranced in a way and kind of curious about how people were communicating in these spaces. But here you have these amazing 3D virtual spaces that you're running around doing all this stuff and shooting and blowing things up, but to communicate, you had to use this 19th century invention of a keyboard. And I thought there was some, something kind of, kind of anachronistic about that. And I was like, like this, this idea came, especially, you know, if you play any first person shooter game, in, in an online context, it's this finite map, and they're literally called maps. But you can call them theaters or sets, right? And I started thinking about these spaces as a kind of performance stage where you kill each other and blow each other up. And I basically kind of like, what do, what do artists do when they're confronted with kind of new spaces? They do things, they, they go in directions that are not prescribed, right? And, and kind of, it, and I started thinking of these spaces as a new type of public space. And why not, as an artist, instead of going in and you know, participating in this prescribed mayhem, why not do something else? So I came up with this idea for an experiment <coughs> where I went into uh, a Star Trek Elite Force Voyager online game. As Alan Ginsberg, rather than play the game, I typed word for word his beat poem, How. And it took <laughs> about six hours. And I was, when I up and I was like, I would not participate. Basically, where I landed, I would keep typing. And, I was just killed over and over again, and I'd be in Rincardi and start typing and get killed. And, you know. and this was really strange. And it was something that I had no idea whether it was interesting, whether this was, you know, I was making really cool art or this was just kind of a stupid idea. It just was something that I just like went with it. Um, and it really was this foundational piece, like the artist mouse, that ended up leading to all kinds of other things. Um, I've done a number of these kind of text-based performances in games. I'm going to show you some of the highlights uh, as, as we go here. Uh, two years later, 2003, I had this idea to kind of uh, up my game, if you will. And I thought, well, why not, instead of just a solo performer in a computer game space, how about a, uh, a performance ensemble, like a group, like a theater group, in a way. So I, I invited uh, five of my uh, digital media students to join me with an experiment to essentially uh, reenact an entire episode from the TV show Friends inside of Quake 3 Arena. And we did this, uh, uh, you can see that's in the Shepherd Fine Arts Gallery at the university. Um, we set this up with uh, six projections, uh, six uh, microphones, uh, you know, individual audio speakers. So we had, basically, we, we all, invaded one server at the same time, and we we're typing from the script while reading it. So when you type and read, it's really kind of, you know, like that. And so this is all going on, and we're getting blown up, and our heads blown off, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was just this, again, a sort of crazy revelation. Uh, and uh, another thing about this piece that was really kind of significant, um, this piece was uh, two days before this performance was scheduled. The uh, Arts Online writer at the time, the New York Times, Mark, uh, Matt Miracle, wrote a piece about it in the New York Times, which was awesome. It was like, you know, it's like millions of people were learning about this, this, this project. Well, it turns out that included a lawyer from Warner Brothers Television um, <laughs> who contacted me, sent, yeah, sent me a, a very nasty sort of cease and desist letter that it was violating uh, Warner Brothers copyright. And, uh, to remove all friends material from my website you know, cancel the performance, all this kind of stuff. And really interesting because I, I it was one of these like, wow, it sort of freaked me out a bit. I went to the university council, and the, the thing you've been learned about lawyers who work for universities is they think about the university first. And so this guy, 
this woman actually sort of panicked. She's like, okay, do everything they say. We can, you know, we can just totally freaked out about having the university being sued by this big Hollywood company. And I knew a little bit about fair use, and I did a little bit of very quick research, and, and I basically went back to them, and I was like, no, this is fair use. I mean, this is, this is criminal. This is satirical. I, I, I'm not. They, they were worried that I was somehow going to go through and re-perform every one of their episodes, which might have been, have been, you know, that's like copying an entire book. And I said, no, I'm just doing one episode. And I'm doing, you know, it's like, this is not, you know. And so they, they, they backed down. Um, but it was, it was still very interesting to think about the producers of the show, possibly the stars of the show, that there was this sort of getting into the culture, into the popular culture, in that kind of interesting way. Um, but <coughs> the, the main thing I want to say about that is that that alone, just that one newspaper article, became this huge mechanism for getting the idea of this work out. Uh, this went viral. This is the first work I've had that, that did that. Um, but in thinking about Quick Friends, I mean, this was a mashup, right? This was basically and a concept to bring together two kind of cultural inanities, one TV show Friends and one Quake, and mash them together and see what came out. Uh, and a sitcom and a computer game, first person shooter like this, are very similar in the sense that they're both very predictable. There's not a whole lot that happens in those spaces, narratively and things that are really, you know, you, you forget about them after you watch them or play them. So all those kind of things I'm sort of saying. Um, this is a, uh, a project, and I'm kind of, I, I, I have jumped back and forth in my work between uh, uh, installation work and this kind of gaming experimentation. I showed a couple of installation projects here. Um, this is a, a piece called uh, East of Fallon Highway 50 Nevada, and uh, I have a video for you, but it's not working, so you can't see the video. I'm sorry. Um, if you go to my website, you can link to this video it's on my YouTube channel. Um, but it's basically a, about an eight foot tall Ferris wheel type structure that has a very, I, took, I went out and photographed a section of Highway 50 in Nevada, just outside of town. And this is what's called the loneliest highway in America. If you've ever driven across it, it's really an amazing experience <coughs> driving across this expanse of desert. And I wanted to create a simulated insulation experience of what it was like to drive on that highway at night. And it's just, it, it is really, pretty intense. So this, on the surface of the inside of the Ferris wheel is a very carefully modeled reproduction of this road and the desert going off on the sides. And then I had this set up with a, a video, uh, a live camera with flashlight bulbs for headlights pointed at the road. Um, and it, this was projected on the wall of the gallery, so as you walked in, it's much darker than the picture up on the top left of the show. And you can see this road just kind of going you know, and, it, and it looks, it's like, it's like any kind of road movie. Think of David Lynch scene or anything, you know, it's just that kind of dark road coming towards you. And what was cool is when people go in there, they were initially, there were several who thought that this was a video, that this was a DVD being played, showing this, right? Um, and then eventually this Ferris wheel structure would emerge. But was, the other thing that's important about this project in terms of my work is this camera was also a network serve, a surveillance camera that had a, IP address, so it allowed for that image to be fed to the internet live. So you could go and watch this road on my website when this was uh, being shown. This was at the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno. Jumping to uh, 2004, another uh, performance project in uh, various computer game spaces. This was a piece called The Great Debates. And Essentially, the idea here was to reenact each of the three presidential debates between George Bush and John Kerry in different game spaces. Um, the first one on the top left was a reenactment in uh, Battlefield Vietnam. There's a controversial uh, uh, kind of fight between the, the various service or lack thereof between John Kerry and, and George Bush at the time. The second one was then in Jedi Knight outcast in Star Wars game, and this is kind of all you know, sort of, uh, saber rattling. And uh, that debate was on uh, uh, a town hall style, so I actually had three computers set up, and there was a questioner, and uh, it's really crazy. Had Jedi masters like punishing me for doing all this stuff in the game, and kind of, kind of weird stuff happening. But by far the most interesting 
was on the bottom right. Uh, this is my first performance inside a, a massively multiplayer online role playing game, The Sims Online. And this was wild. Uh, you know, as I said before, when I do these performances, I would not break from character. Like, people would be attacking me, like, how are you doing, Code? You know, or, you know, or, you know, just kind of trying to communicate with me. I just would keep typing. I just was like, being almost like a mine on the street. Um, but in this one, so I, I would go back and forth from being John Kerry to George Bush, depending on the text. And I downloaded the, the, the transcript from the various debates from the New York Times the day after the debate. So this is within, within about two days of each debate doing these performances. And they took about eight hours each uh, to do the entire debate. The Sims one was crazy. Um, I found myself going in these spaces and I'd be typing and someone would come up and say, hey, it's really good. it's fine that you're doing that, but do you mind contributing to my land? And so if you're on someone's property, they want to like play the piano or lift weights or mow the lawn so that they get points. So I started doing these activities. Like, Here's George Bush in the hot tub with the ladies. Um, and, and people started, and, and actually, no joke, both John Kerry and George Bush separately got asked to perform weddings, which they did. Uh, Really, it was, this was something else, so this was kind of, kind of stuck in my head. Um, from there, and, and again, this sort of going back and forth between my practice in terms of doing gaming-oriented projects and then doing more sort of physical installation projects. This was a, a project that was in the works for two years, from 2004 to 2006. And similar to the East of Family Highway 50, although moving forward with that, the, the idea here was I had four cameras um, that were networked through a digital kind of switcher box that would create a kind of random uh, editing from one camera to the next. And I had been building these kinetic dioramas based on photographs from the Iraq and the Afghanistan war, primarily Iraq. Uh, and I have this, this background as a kind of a master model, model builder as a teenager into, uh, into my 20s. And I started sort of reproducing things like there's an album grade photograph reproducing on 35th scale. And I was making these things and they would be moving and I would move things. And, and the idea was to have a 24 hour a day kind of photo documentary from my studio that would be on the internet that would look like you were watching documentary uh, uh, video from the war. So I'm working on this piece and uh, had a devastating flood in my studio um, in, uh, on New Year's Eve 2005 down with my family in San Francisco and there was this freak storm. And long story short, but my entire studio filled up like a swing. And I lost all the work, my computer, slides, everything just, just vanished. Only thing I had with me was my laptop, which uh, became very important. Uh, but this this was like literally like wiping this like clean. And uh, this will seem a little disjointed as I, as I jumped here, but prior to this, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, uh, but in uh, January 2004, the website, this website was launched, and this is a collection of all 5,201 entries to the World Trade Center Memorial Site competition. Uh, the winner of the competition is there, as you can go see this now, actually, in New York. And I remember when this came out, this was about, uh, about nine months into the invasion of Iraq and things were definitely not going well and not going as they were promised and uh, it was definitely opposed to the invasion uh, before it ever happened and I remember when this came out and I just thought to myself, wow, you know, I started thinking what's going to be our next memorial in Washington to our soldiers who are dying in an unnecessary war. Um, and, and then I started speculating, why that there'll never be a memorial to the civilians in Iraq who are dying in ever greater numbers than were uh, killed on the um, And such things, and these ideas were kind of uh, percolating. And so there were some concepts that were developed around this, but I was still involved in that installation that was destroyed and fled. But once that got destroyed, it's like, okay, I, I kind of dived into this work. Um, but that notion of like, what's a memorial? Uh, what, how do we how do we remember wars? How do we remember those who have died? And you know, just a couple of examples. You know, uh, Myland's amazing Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington D.C., which is really controversial when it was proposed, and uh, but it's it's fascinating because it's 
literally a scar in the landscape, and, and you know it doesn't glorify. Tends to. This is a uh, memorial to Global One uh, soldiers in uh, Toronto, to our glorious dead, it says on that, which is kind of odd. Um, but also started thinking about, well, how do you protest? How, as an artist uh, living in the United States, you know, in the last decade, in the midst of two wars, you know, incredible conflicts going on, uh, I, I was really politicized by particularly the invasion of Iraq, but 9-11, you know, it really kind of uh, shifted, and it was a big shift, uh, messed with anything. And seeing how we reacted to that as a country was really depressing and, and upsetting. And I, I felt myself activated uh, politically. Um, so one of the ideas I had when thinking about the, uh, the, the WTC memorial site coincides roughly 2003 this new computer game is released by the Defense Department called the America's Army Game. And uh, this is a computer game that is freely downloadable. It's one of the, it has been one of the top three most popular freely downloadable games worldwide. Um, and I remember when this game came out, reading about it, I was like, wow, something, there's something as an artist that, that needs to be done in this game. But it was such a serious game that it just sort of sat. But then this idea came, and again, from that WTC. Uh, uh, site. Uh, so, essentially in America's Army, you go through basic training, you go through rifle training, uh, and then you're allowed to go online and play with other players. Um, but what I started doing, my idea was essentially to use the America's Army game website, America's Army game, as a site for a political protest and a memorial at the same time. So instead of playing the game, I actually go into the I go into the game, I drop my weapon, and I start typing. And um, I'm actually going to switch here from awkwardly uh, to my website so you can see this. This is a recording of my actions in the game. Uh, so Responded to anyone in the game 
was when someone would just say, oh, it's just a bot. You know, the bot is an automated player, like, and, and you could set up something like that to do that. And they would say, it's just a bot. And I would just like, no, I'm not a bot. And I would just like, keep going. Just so they, they would know that there was a person doing this durational, very careful typing of these uh, 4,000, it's 4,500 something uh, in, in the end. Um, my ultimate goal was to get kicked out of the server. Right, and that meant that essentially all eight of, all seven of eight of the players noticed what I was doing. Um, and my intention with this is to sort of get inside their brain, but but to, but uh, with a couple of things. One, when you type these things in, you notice that it then disappears. So it's like if you think of it almost as an analog to my lens, you know, the names carved in marble or. Or on the, uh, uh, the World Trade Center side, if you've seen that, you know, they get cut into the, the metal, uh, sort of laser cut. You know, it's very similar, but it's in this sort of virtual context, and it's there and it's forgotten. I think there's a nice metaphor there in terms of how uh, poorly we have kind of even remembered our, our, our own soldiers who have died. And, um, but my, you know, a couple things with this. Um, you know, when I was 18 and coming out of high school, I, my goal all my life was to join the military. I had no sense of what else to do with my life, and I was always very, very interested in going that direction. To the point of having a recruiter uh, come to my house, and the next stage was to go to the Presidio in San Francisco, take the test, where they <coughs> decide where they're going to put me. And I had a really, one of those life-changing experiences. The recruiter came to my house as a Vietnam veteran, this was 1981. And he saw something in me, or I don't know what it was, but basically, unbelievably, this recruiter actually talked me out of joining the military. He said, you know, this is not for everyone. And he saw something, you know, it was just one of those things where I'm like this, you know, 18-year-old, uh, right? And, you know, you have sort of half a brain at that point, particularly when you're a guy. Uh, but, yeah, you know, it's like, it's like you're going along in life like this, and someone does something, and you go like that, you know? And, in typing these names into that space, it's like I was hoping that I was doing the same thing. Maybe there was some young person who was just playing this game feverishly, and then maybe they got really upset, but then maybe after they finished that game, they were still thinking about it, right? These kind of games don't encourage you to think, and, and particularly a game like this that is essentially presenting such a fallacious depiction of war, right? I mean, it just it's, has, it's a cartoon, you know? Uh, and there are people getting blown up and really dying. And by bringing those, bring those names into this space, it's like closing a loop. In the same way that you can think about this game having been instrumental in recruiting people to join the military, some of those people are coming home dead. So it's like, you know, it's like kind of like playing with people's heads in terms of thinking about this as a game. Um, what was further interesting about this was, uh, this was not a project that I publicized, that I really like it. I was, I was uncomfortable with this being like an art project. Uh, there was some sort of hybrid. Um, and, but it started getting out that people started writing about it. And what, was, what became really an important part of this project, uh, there was a piece on Salon.com and Wired.com. And, and uh, the stories were, were really great, it was really cool. But then reading the comments, they just had you know, pages and pages of comments, and mostly very negative. Um, and people just say, someone should go break this guy's legs, it's unpatriotic, you know, you don't love this kind of elite, all this kind of thing. And I started using that as a form for dialogue, right? So actually going into these spaces and communicating directly with these people who were trashing my, my, my efforts. And it became really interesting because I was able, to, at least at several points, to be able to kind of talk someone to a point where they at least understood where I was coming from. Uh, but one of the most Interesting thing is that constantly people would say in reply to what I was doing was, and you'll, you would see it in the game or, or outside of it, this is a game, this is a game, this is a game. I come here to escape. Um, and, and things like, man, why don't you go to the steps of the federal building with a sign and, and, and protest? This is not the space to do this. And I would reply, this is precisely the space to do this. This is federal property. You are playing a game in federal space. This is government sanctioned space. It's like going on, this is part of the war, right? It's not disconnected. And so it was, that, you know, was, was really kind of a, a 
very intense experience in terms of kind of actually communicating with others while I was in the process of creating the work, you know, having this kind of dialogue, this kind of debate. Um, so I want to show a couple projects that were related to this. Uh, in uh, 2000, uh, 2008, I was fortunate to be awarded a uh, commissioned res residency at I in New York City. And while I was there, I met uh, some amazing artists, including uh, Steve Lambert and um, uh, some of the, one, one of the members of, of the Yes Men. And, um, and they were working on this project, which is this fake New York Times. How many of you guys have heard about this project? Um, fake New York Times, really ambitious, amazing project that involved a number of activist groups and about 35 writers. Anyway, it was like creating this utopian fake copy of the New York Times about the Iraq war ending and all kinds of other things that were added to it. And, and they were in the initial phases of making this and I proposed, I said, hey, could I write an article for this? And eventually uh, I did. This was my article, it's in the education section. You can, this is online, you can find this online in the fake New York Times, but they also did print edition, uh, thousands of copies that they passed out to subway, people coming out of the subway in New York. Um, but anyway, in the education section, I wrote this uh, story called Popular America's Army Video Game Recru Recruiting Tool Canceled. And the gist of the story was that all the funding from the America's Army game was being switched to create a new game called America's Diplomat. Right? And sort of playing on that, um, where the diplomatic corps had actually shrunk during the Bush years while their military was exploding. Um, and I actually created a faux homepage um, that was linked to by the article uh, for the America's Diplomat game, um, which of course didn't exist, but uh, this was completely appropriated from the design of the American Army Center, which is basically built on top of the design. Um, and if you clicked on it, you went to a, um, a dialogue in the area where you can kind of discuss the, the project. Some other projects related to this include, this is my America's Army action figure. Um, they actually put out America's Army action figures, uh, real America's Army, <coughs> real heroes, um, and this is based on soldiers who had done something heroic and actually survived and come home. And I kit bashed using my model skills again to sort of build a, a perhaps different America's Army uh, action figure. And the curious thing about this um, is that if you go online and you do a search for America's Army action figure on Google, you get this for, through an image search. And this was unexpected, but you can see there's one, two, three, four, five of my projects come up when you do that Google search. And I didn't know, I, this was totally unexpected. I was actually doing some research looking for the American Army action figure. So it's a weird kind of unintended infiltration into internet culture. Um, and this is a, a large scale reproduction of, of my uh, avatar from the America's Army game re, uh, recreated using uh, uh, cardboard and Tepicura techniques, uh, polygon sculpture. I'll we'll talk more about that, uh, that technique in a moment. Um, the other project that came out of, again, the WTC uh, project was in looking at this and, again, speculating. Gosh, you know, we never do, we don't do uh, memorials about the victims. And thinking about this and the uh, you know the the, you know, the horrible attack of 9/11 and all that totally legitimate to be concerned and do a memorial and all these kind of things, but at the same time, as I like started thinking about there were many thousands of, of civilians in Iraq who were dying um, when this was published, and I had the, the, the initial idea was in a way to sort of do what the New York Times project did, was to do a kind of switcher version, right? I could have taken the code of this and actually recreated this as a site. Remember civilian casualties in Iraq, but it, I, I, I abandoned that very quickly. Um, here's some uh, some rough <coughs> statistics um, regarding some of the estimates of civilian casualties in the war in Iraq. Um, you know, it, and it's it's pretty sobering. The 2006 Lancet study was one that was very controversial, but um, amazing to actually hear about their methodology and learn how they did this. Um, 1.2 million is is more recent from a, a opinion research. This is, you know, this is the, you know, we don't do body counts. We don't, you know, it, three million uh, uh, refugees from the Iraq invasion. I mean, it's just devastating to, to, to the country. Um, so, you know, I decided that 
this issue deserved its own focus, its own project. And I created this website in 2007 called Iraq and the Wild uh, And it is an ongoing call to artists, architects, anyone to propose imagined memorials to the civilian casualties in Iraq. And it's, uh, there's almost 200 entries on the site at this time. Uh, these, this is what a page would look like in you know, the synopsis and you have an image. Uh, just two examples here of the diversity of work. This is by Rashid Salim. He's a Iraqi refugee who lives in, in uh, the United Kingdom. He's proposing a series of pipe workshops uh, some bridges in Baghdad. And the one on the right, Matt Kenny, an amazing artist. This is a project he actually created uh, called Notepads. And this is really cool work where he actually manufactured uh, yellow pads, right? But the lines are microtext that you can't see with the naked eye the way names of those civilian casualties. If you use a magnifying glass, you can see them. But the coolest part is he surreptitiously had these manufactured uh, yellow pads put into the office supplies of the Congress so that you have congressmen writing and taking notes, and then when those notes would get put into their files and then go into the National Archives. So this is really, really interesting intervention. Um, Amazing artist, look him up, uh, does really cool work. Um, the project has become a traveling exhibition. Uh, I had two jurors reviews. There's no winner to this competition, because of course a monument of this sort will never be built. Um, part of the concept. But I had two jurors reviews, and the jurors were invited to pick out their top 10 favorite uh, uh, proposals. For the exhibition, I invited the, those artists who were selected by our two slates of juries to recreate the proposals as, as in the same exact size as the proposal boards that were submitted for the World Trade Center site. Uh, this is the first exhibition at the Shepherd Fine Arts Gallery, 56 of the proposals, including videos, etc. Um, this traveled to uh, the Lizard Foundation for the Arts in New York. Uh, this opened on September 9th, last year, two days before the unveiling of the 9 11 memorial. So it's a really interesting kind of resonance there. Um, it has uh, since then traveled to Works uh, San Jose, and I, I'm hoping to keep this traveling. Uh, over the next few years, uh, particularly with the 10th anniversary of the start of the world coming next in March. Um, but that's just a project, just, this is like artist slash curator slash activist, you know, kind of putting this work out there. Uh, the website has tended to get about 30,000 hits a month. Um, really, you know, it's nice. That, that it has gotten out there. Um, I was recently invited to Baghdad, actually, uh, which may happen this summer, may happen next fall, but my goal is to actually get this exhibition shown in Baghdad someday. Um, shifting gears here a little bit, reenactment. Um, so one of the things that happened when I'm doing the Marriage Army Project in one of these discussions with somebody, and I don't remember if it was on YouTube or it's part of one of those comment sections after an article. But there was there was some guy who said, dude, you got a Gandhi complex. And I was like, what? Like, that's an insult, you know? Um, I should be so lucky. And that just was one of those things that kind of stuck with me. And so I, that, that became a sort of mediation point for a pretty significant work. Um, so, you know, and one of the things with the America's Army Project in particular, people are constantly questioning that arena, the computer game, as a venue for protest. As so I started reading about the history of protest, I'm curious about the lineage. And when you start researching protest, all roads lead to God. Right? I mean, he was a formative, I would say he was like probably the most brilliant conceptual artist in, in the last century. Uh, his ideas and his, like, it just, he really created a lot of the modes that we still see very active in terms of protest and nonviolence and all these kind of things. And I had had some ideas some time before about doing a performance that would involve a kind of walk across computer game spaces instead of playing or talking, just walking, right? And so this kind of came together. And reading about the salt march, Gandhi salt march, it just all made sense. And so this is the project I proposed to IBM, uh, and which I created primarily during my residency. I created a Gandhi avatar in the second line, the M. Gandhi Shepherd Rising. And uh, then created a treadmill as a game control. So this, this is a self-powered treadmill. It doesn't involve a motor. You actually have to push this to get it to go. This is a more <coughs> walk-fit treadmill I got for $163 on eBay. 
Um, and I built this desk, this kind of round desk, and I set this up where my steps became Gandhi's steps. And so I, I did this on the anniversary dates of the actual march. Um, uh, and I it was March 12th, I think, something. I'm forgetting the dates at this point. But I marched on the exact dates, and I took a rest day when he and his followers rested. There were three rest days, but it was basically 24 days of walking approximately 10 miles per day uh, on the treadmill. In, in Ivy, people would be able to come and visit and watch and do this. And uh, this was a, uh, a, a revelation. Let me again switch over to you. This is actually a stop action of the entire march. I, I, I had set up a little plug-in to um, record a screenshot every minute of the march. And so there's several thousand screenshots on here depicting all my time in second. Um, and what was amazing about this experience was uh, you're familiar with durational performance art, right? And that's one of the things that sort of spurred me to this idea. All those other works are definitely durational, Dead in Iraq, uh, Quake Friends. I mean, there's a durational aspect of typing and doing this thing with the keyboard. But one of the things is you're not being physical, you're not using your body, right? And these durational performances in the history of New York City, people like Linda Mons know, uh, you know, there was these time based, like putting the body in contest with the work, right? I mean, you could fail because you were your body, your physical being was, was central. So I went into this with this kind of conceptual idea of doing this march and what was what was really kind of curious that I didn't fully expect um, was that I became completely absorbed in the experience uh, to the point where you know I would be walking along uh, with Gandhi and he'd be walking on the top of the mountain and fall off and I would practically fall off the keyboard. The, the treadmill, right? Or I'd be walking uh, to the subway to go back to my apartment afterwards and I would suddenly have a deja vu walking down the stairs like I was back in Second Life. Or I would see people on the street and I would literally be like seeing someone and thinking that I could click on them and get information, you know? I mean, it was just like, I was like so absorbed in this experience. Emotional, like, like my, the, the conceptual intellectual part and the ideas to do this performance became subsumed by this experience. This was incredible. And people were universally happy to see me because everybody loves Gandhi, right? And, which had a connection to the America's Army game and the Iraqi Memorial Project, which were both very kind of deep, heavy about death. Particularly America's Army, because so many people just really angry at me. It was really nice to be wanted and to have people kind of being friendly to me. Uh, so I, want, I, I would basically, my, if you've been in Second Life, you this, put up this little mini map, and I would navigate towards the little green dots, which were other residents, and I would stop and introduce myself, and I would offer a gift of my walking stick, and say, would you like to join me? I'm, I'm, my, my human is making me walk. We are reenacting Gandhi Salt Mark, walking 240 miles. He's on a treadmill making me go, etc. And people were astounded. They were just like, what? <laughs> and, and, then, and so they would walk with me a bit. There were some people who walked with me for several days. I made all kinds of friends. Uh, but it was really interesting too, like literally being the one avatar, the one person in this entire Second Life universe out of usually between 30 and 70,000 people on there at a time, who was actually using my body, you know, to actually walk, uh, to, to make my, my avatar go. Um, the other thing that's really curious about this is Second Life is not designed for walking, right? It's you teleport or you fly. That's how you transport. So it was oddly contiguous to kind of, kind of like walking in most spaces in the United States. Right? It's not made for walking. So it's very similar in the sense that you would have to really kind of explore to navigate your way around. But I also ended up seeing more of Second Life than probably most people ever do, and parts of it that you probably don't usually want to see. Um, but the experience is meeting folks and meeting other avatars. Uh, this one on the top left is a, someone who was at a dragon apprentice class. And um, on the top right is another project by an artist, um, a care artist. Uh, this is Gone Gitmo. It's a simulation of what it was like to be a prisoner at Guantanamo Bay. Bottom left is a guy who came up to, he was a 
Furby. You guys know what Furbies are? Um, he was a Furby and he saw me and he changed it to Nixon giving the Chucker speech. Right? So he's, you know, it's just, it's just magical. Um, uh, top left is a group of uh, people walking with me. This is the Princeton University website. Top right, I just walked into a Star Trek class. Uh, which, if you think about it, it's kind of like Nerd Squared, you know? Um, so the, you know, and uh, hanging with the homies down on the left, uh, these two on the right, the two avatars from India who heard about the project and started walking with me. Um, and this is the final day of the march. A um, number of uh, people who had walked with me uh, and final steps were literally the last mile after I got to the end of this spit of land on a particular island and it was quite magical. Um, but this is one of these experiences that like changed me. I mean, my work, and, and this wasn't, I wasn't protesting anything, but it was about protest. It was about exploring, like, what does it mean to put your body in a committed position to something that is actually I wasn't even going anywhere, right? I'm standing still using this exercise machine. You know, this really, there was all kinds of things going on with this, but the, the unexpected outcome was this incredible connection to this avatar. And so when it was over, I was really sad. Um, and, but it was like I had to let it go. But at the same time, I couldn't. And there was an exhibition as part of the residency at IV at the end of the residency and to show documentation of this experience. And so I, I started strategizing about how to do, how to make work that would somehow express the magnitude of this experience that I had just gone through. Um, so I worked with some uh, open source software that was actually developed by another resident at IBM, uh, a program called Moggle, to extract the Gandhi data, my avatar, from Second Line, and then worked with a wonderful program called Capacura Designer, um, which is a, a shareware program that's uh, available on the internet to start thinking about creating this gigantic paper craft sculpture of Gandhi. And Papakir is usually used, hobbyists, there's like amazing stuff online of people creating figures and models of airplanes and all kinds of things. Lots of anime figures, lots of game figures get to be made of these like small scale inkjet print, beautiful. Uh, it's basically like a poor man's rapid prototype using paper, right? Um, but I wanted to do something big, so I basically kind of invented a process using an overhead projector and transparencies to scale it up, scale it up uh, using cardboard. And here I am kind of creating this piece in six weeks of intense physical labor, building and inventing a process for getting this to create this gigantic cardboard gun. And the result was it's really amazing. Um, 17 feet tall, I, I uh, made the decision to create him as tall as Michelangelo's David, uh, which I thought was appropriate for Gandhi. Uh, but entirely made from less than $200 worth of materials, right? And I, I think Gandhi would have appreciated cardboard, recycled material, hot glue, you know, and, and kind of found uh, carpet tubings to put inside the legs and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it was just this incredible thing. And it was, I had finished this project and was going to head back home to Reno after the six month residency. And I got contacted by the curators of an amazing exhibition, exhibition in China, the Guangzhou Training. Uh, the title of the show was called uh, Farewell to Post Colonialism. And they wanted to show Gandhi. And I was like, man, that's awesome. I built him in pieces. He's actually going to be shipped. And they were like, no, we don't want to ship. We want you to build another one. And uh, so I'm like, you know, crap, you know. And, um, <laughs> But I did it. I actually, I was like, okay, we're gonna go with it. And I went to I went to Guangzhou for three weeks, and I worked with a crew of museum workers and uh, student volunteers, and we built another one out of local materials locally. And um, he has a slightly different character. This was in like one of the best uh, rooms of this really crazy exhibition. 170 artists, um, and he just commanded the space, and the people loved him. They took pictures with him. And a curator saw a curator from Europe saw him and said, "I want you to build one in Belgium." <laughs> and I was like, "Crazy!" You know, like, and, but I did it. Um, <laughs> so this one was built at the Art Academy in Mech Mechelen, uh, Belgium. It's part of a wonderful show called "All That Is Solid Melts Into Air." Uh, this was curated by Muka, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp, and um, he just commanded this space. Really, really amazing. But 
But both of these became, well, the first one was like this solo building kind of durational physical active building. These are more like these community things where it was like students were learning and working with faculty, meeting all these wonderful people. Um, and he then got shipped in pieces, driven actually, to uh, Isaiah in Belfast, Ireland. Uh, so this is where, this is in the atrium of the uh, University of Ulster in Belfast, which I just love that Gandhi was going to Belfast, right? Um, he was worse for wear and tear uh, by the end of this. He had been up for six months in, in Belgium and a month here, and it was obvious he wasn't going to survive another rebuild. And so I asked him, in my absence, because I had to go home, to, to destroy him. Uh, but don't take any pictures, don't shoot any video, uh, and be sure that all the cardboard was recycled. And it was really cool because there was one of the students who was helping out build the project. He was like, oh, hey, um, I'm, I'm involved in guerrilla gardening projects in Belfast. I'll make sure that the cardboard gets into our commons. And so Gandhi is now helping plants grow in the middle of these rows in Belfast, which I just really like that. Um, so he's gone. Uh, the one in China, they, they uh, procured him for, his collect, for the collection at the museum. The first Gandhi I saw having bits in, in my studio. And actually, gonna be, I think we're installing it in the UNR next fall. Um, but after this, uh, I had some, long story short, I ended up going back to Gandhi. I kind of stopped the work, but I decided to continue at one point um, by reenacting, basically about a month after the end of the soft march, Gandhi was put into prison by the British for nine months uh, to kind of get him out of the picture uh, because he had raised such a ruckus with the soft march, which the British thought was going to be a total failure. So I started a new project where I, as opposed to freely roaming Second Life for the month of the Salt March, I put Gandhi in a reproduction of his jail cell at the Kuna Jail 24-7 um, live. And so I had to set up another computer in my office where he was always on. And I would interact as I could. Uh, but he was there 24-7. And after a few months, it kind of was like, I felt like I needed to do something else in that space. This was about the time that the, uh, the Obama administration released the, uh, the, the Bush era torture memos, right? And so Gandhi started, basically read all of the torture memos from the Bush years, um, typed them into the chat in Second Life, but I had, I was using a little, you see that little Twitter box thing? This, this was a plugin somebody had made so that you could text in Second Life and your text would be to your Twitter account. And so I was basically, Gandhi's typing these torture memos, and then they're feeding to my Twitter account, which I also set up to then feed to my Facebook account. So this was like a three-tiered republishing of these really horrible texts. And you can see this, basically you can read it from the bottom up, right? So it basically is a kind of reverse publication. And kind of like redoing the debates, it's like a public service, right? It's basically sort of putting this stuff out there. Um, and the same information was going to Facebook. Um, when Facebook used to actually look at these. But, um, it, it, was, it was interesting. I lost a lot of friends on Facebook because I mean, there were people who were like, wow, this is really cool. And then after about two months of daily you know, torture memos coming on that, you know. Um, but what I really like is, is you know, Facebook is archived. Right? It's out there. I mean, all this stuff is 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 out there somewhere uh, in this new form. Um, at the end of this experience, uh, I got approached by uh, Scott Kildall, Patrick Lickby, a number of friends that I had met in Second Life, actually over the course of doing this salt march, who were in a, a performance group called Second Front, and they uh, essentially <laughs> approached me and said, "We want to break Gandhi out of jail." as a performance piece. And I said, well, the performance is ending on January 21st. That's the end. And they said, oh, we don't care. We're going to break them out. So here you see <laughs> members of Second Front with jackhammers and, and bulldozers. And they, they kind of blew up the front door. <coughs> Again, I have a video that's, that's not functioning here, so you don't want to see that. But I, I just I, I came up with this event surrounding 
this last day, and I figured something big had to happen. And so they, they broke him out of jail. And then, you know, I, I created this celebrity riddle rock concert that was this celebration of Gandhi's release. And it was called the Gigi Hoop Band, Gandhi's Global Gaming Release Party and uh, Sing Along. And so basically invited people to come in Second Life as their favorite celebrity, right? And using the voice, uh, voice communication system that's now functional in Second Life to actually sing songs of freedom and protest. And I put a whole list of songs that we we're going to do on my website. And uh, people came. Yes. yes. As everyone you can imagine. And I made the stage, like the, the compound that was his prison became the stage set. And we had, you know, Prince Charles, the Pope, it was Chicolina, and, uh, you know, it was, it was crazy. And I have a video, I'm going to switch here again. Um, yeah, that's John Rackman. And uh, let me see if I can actually get to what I'm looking for. So we did all kinds of songs. Uh, and something. 
And I woke up one morning and just got this inspiration to put post needle bark for sale on eBay. And, um, this was on there for about two hours and got about 2,000 hits. I think he got up to about uh, $60. And when eBay contacted me and said, and basically banned me for two weeks for breaking their policy of selling humans or human body parts. And, <laughs> And it's really funny that the best part of this was, well, it did, it did go viral, actually. There was a reporter from the Village Voice who put it on their blog, and it kind of went all over the internet. And, you know, it was, it was fun. Um, but serious as well. But what was really cool is the questions people sent me about it. Like, the first one there says, I'll buy him only if, if, only if I can pay you in shekels and you deliver him mummified in a sarcophagus. Um, the other one says, why is he in Reno? Has he actually left Egypt? What is the actual weight for shipping, please? Will you combine shipping charges for multiple <laughs> dignities? There's a whole bunch of these that came. It's really, 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 really cool. Uh, uh, this is one that uh, you can look at. It's on my website. But this was a performance I did online uh, using chapter -like. This is called chapter -like Discipline and Punishment. <laughs> So essentially, it's, it's yeah, I'm reading uh, Michel, Michel Foucault and uh, his book, Discipline and Punish, and I read the entire chapter on the Panopticon in chapter, uh, which, you know, if you know about the Panopticon, it is this kind of, you know, you don't see someone surveilling you. And this was really fun and really intense as well. So there's, there's video on my, on my website, you can check that out. Um, Shifting back a little bit here, uh, the America's Army Project, I finished this, actually I typed in the last names on December 18th, which was the official date we removed our last troops from Iraq. Um, but last summer, I, I was on a residency in, in Beijing, China, and I was working on a project where I was essentially turning these screenshots from the America's Army game into drawings. Um, this is one of the first experiments. The, the works that I created in China are actually, I separated the avatar from the background and uh, reproduced them on, uh, basically on 22 by 30 inch uh, BFK paper in, in the center. And I'm looking at these as a kind of, again, that's sort of taking the digital back into the analog, because these land up having a weird sort of, you're not sure where these come from when you look at them. Um, and I've also, this, I'm really interested in kind of the, the history of combat art, right? Of artists who were attached to combat units, particularly in World War II. Uh, some of the work by the German expressionists drawing their experiences in the trenches and that. And that these become this way of kind of reifying these images of nothing. You know, I mean, these are basically, you know, these, these fake bits of data of this game and spend this time staring at them and drawing. And it, these were my first representational drawings, probably like 25 years. I had my undergraduate training in graphic design and illustration. Um, and curiously, I found this experience of, of going back to this process of careful observation and drawing to have this similar sort of contemplative durational aspect like the Gandhi march or like the typing. And there's really this kind of effort that goes into to kind of making this kind of work. Um, so this is, this is something that I'm still working on. I'm really kind of uh, now starting to turn towards uh, perhaps drawing landscapes in these spaces, in game, gaming environments. I mean, these, this is our new landscape, right? So it's like, why not, why not turn these into these kind of, these, these documents, these artworks that have a kind of slippage between reality and, and the virtual. Um, uh, this is the, uh, the poster, postcard from my exhibition in, in Beijing at the end of my residency. And these are a pair of uh, further ex exploration of using computer <coughs> software. But there was a, a game that came out <coughs> about two years ago now where you could play as a Taliban. I don't know if you remember that was very controversial. Um, and I, I bought that game and I extracted data. This is actually one of two Taliban hands that are like holding a pistol. And I reproduced them roughly about yay big each and kind of put them in a different position where they're almost kind of supine, almost kind of curved. And using the same type of cure techniques that I've started working with corrugated plastic, uh, which is really interesting because it's a much stronger material, also comes in different colors. And, I, and I'm exploring some other possibilities. But this is the exhibition in, in Beijing. You can see the kind of scale of these, these hands. Um, 
Uh, more recently, I, I put uh, Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, on Craigslist. On uh, about 75 different Craigslist listings around the world, looking for a job. Um, uh, so this was everywhere. I posted this in Baghdad, Beirut, uh, London, New York, all over, every, all 50 states. Um, and finally, just to show you two projects, two areas that I'm moving into. Uh, this is that game I was speaking of, I think it's really this Medal of Honor, where you're playing a Taliban. really fascinates me that in, in contemporary first-person shooters that are based on warfare and terrorism and that, that 50% of all the players are playing being a terrorist at any given time, right? So when you play these games, you are actually reenacting being a terrorist. You know, something really strange about that. You know? Um, and so this, this notion of these kind of, these fear, these mythological beings that are going to destroy our country and our democracy, and we've done all of this, Homeland Security stuff, airports, everything built around this fear of these, these people, and yet we're playing them, playing being them in a game. Weird, weird, uh, kind of syndrome type thing going on there. Um, so I, I'm continuing to extract data. My goal, what I would like to do, this is kind of just a rendering of what I would kind of envision, but to create kind of 20 foot tall uh, terrorist out of Hepicura, that would be a kind of polygon sculpture, likely in black or perhaps orange uh, corrugated plastic to sort of represent the, uh, the jumpsuits and that orange threat level and all that kind of stuff. But to make this real, like to bring this, this out. I've also had some ideas about um, really interested in cosplay and you know they all dress up as game characters. It's like, well, why not go to one of those game conferences dressed as a terrorist? You know, um, right? It's a game character, you know. Um, but those kind of ideas are just kind of swimming around right now. In um, a kind of another direction, but related. This is a, a, a pretty big project um, that I, I proposed uh, for Isaiah and for some other contexts as well, <coughs> related to. Related to the Ghani <coughs> and also issues of the war and, and energy independence in particular, um, I read somewhere uh, that uh, the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists has basically um, estimated that it would take a solar farm uh, 100 miles by 100 miles square somewhere in the southwest of the United States to produce enough power for the entire country. Right? That sounds kind of reasonable to me. And what this project involves is essentially riding a bicycle in four southwestern states, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah, and doing four 400 mile bike rides with GPS technology um, and taking uh, a trailer, bike trailer that has a solar array and uh, cameras and um, basically will be like the artist mouse, right, but dragging a piece of surveyor's chalk. So I would literally be drawing this line, outlining what this space would be as I, as I ride through the southwestern desert on roads. Um, but also, what I want to do is a kind of, similar to the Gandhi march where I'm on a treadmill making my avatar go, what I want to do is have an avatar using uh, Blue Mars in Google Earth to have an avatar that could be on a bicycle so you could follow me on uh, Google Earth as I do this project. And I think of this proposal, I think of this project as a demonstration and a demonstration. Has political ramifications in terms of our independence uh, from, from oil and uh, uh, dirty kinds of energy. And it goes in a bit of a different direction, but it's connected definitely as well to what I've been doing over the years. So we'll see if this comes to pass. Um, anyway, thank you very much. There were there were a couple people who were like there, there were one or two people who were like, dude, poetry and killing, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't I don't recall anyone kind of acknowledging it as such, but it was definitely there was definitely some a weird kind of adherence of that poem in that space. I mean from from my point of view. Um, it's you know, yeah, it, it made sense. 
whether where they got it. And you know, a lot of those earlier pieces, it was I was not so concerned that they'd be paying attention. Um, because it was really, it was more so about just putting this in that space and if somebody got it and did it not, I mean most people are just focused on getting as many places as possibly can. Um, so I mean that, that, but that's, there, there's commentary in there as well, right? Because I mean that, that notion of putting, putting, uh, putting this amazing work of literature, this poem, into this space is similar to putting the, the debate in that space. It's like, this is something you're not paying attention to. And this is something you're not doing. You know, so there, there might be a kind of finger wagging, kind of scolding thing in a way, but it's more sort of like humorous. Like, you know, here, here's something that might be more interesting than you're doing. You know? And whether they know it or not, it wasn't all that. about your work is the number of different kinds of audiences that each piece addresses. How do you negotiate the different audiences, let's say in some, a piece like Dead in Iraq where you've got the players of the game who are one kind of audience, they're witnessing a performance but they don't necessarily know, well they think they're witnessing perhaps a different kind of performance than they are, and then you've got the future viewers of the video and who are looking at it perhaps as a document, but then someone else might look at it as a piece of video art and they have a different set of uh, associations with that. So how do you work with all of those different kinds of audiences? I think that's what's interesting about this kind of work that I've sort of fallen into is that, that you know, the, the number of things, to go off of your, your question there, the, you know, when you, show, when you show a piece in a gallery space, um, you might get, you know, Several hundred, maybe a thousand people might actually experience the work one-on-one, -on -one. and there's something very important about that. Right? To actually go to a space and with that effort and kind of focus, but that sense of being able to reach potentially thousands and millions of people through something going on the internet and kind of going viral, something really attractive and seductive about that. Um, but the those various audiences, I mean, that's that's something that's quite quite unexpected. With, with, with a project like that, and the you know the the exchanges, the email exchanges that I would have with the mother of a, of a killed soldier who totally supported what I was doing, to the brother of a killed soldier who objected to what I was doing, and we were eventually actually interviewed and having kind of a discussion on NPR uh, debate in a way this was really intense, and that that led to a whole other audience kind of getting that. Um, but I like the. I mean, the core, the core thing with, with all of this work really is this uh, internet, right? I mean, that, that allows for a kind of, allows someone like me to take a stance and move into some new territory that I wasn't even sure was art. I mean, and it's one of the most interesting things actually with the Dead in Iraq project. When I started that project, um, I really had a discomfort in in claiming it as an artwork, you know, and and it was really telling because when I would get into these debates in on these comment sections and, and some blogs and that, as soon as I identified myself as an artist, I was dismissed. I mean, literally, like, oh, you're just a fucking liberal professor, like, go away, you know. And then it was like, then it was like, whoa, my defenses would go. I would say, wait a minute, you know, I'm a taxpayer. I'm, you know, I'm a citizen. I'm helping to pay for this as you are. I have something to say about this, whether it's an art project or not. You know, that's, you know, so it became, it kind of pushed me to kind of invest in myself as an artist and as it being an artwork and as it being completely legitimate, but also being a form of protest. So, you know, in some ways I'm adjusting myself as, a, as an artist while they're, while I'm kind of, you know, encouraging them to rethink their role as an audience member, as, as a citizen, as a potential recruit, you know, all these kind of things. Um, but I've had really amazing and intense experiences with that work um, that related to audience. I mean, uh, this video uh, was done at a really interesting part of a conference in, uh, at UC Santa Cruz in an exhibition called Intervene, Interrupt. And it was all artists kind of doing this kind of intervention, this practice. And the gallery people were kind during the exhibition, and they said, you know, we have uh, 
a student who's watching your piece and they ran from the gallery crying. And they, they followed the guy and he was, they found him kind of in the courtyard outside and he was weeping into his hands. And they were like, are you okay? And, and he was like, and he was just like totally shaken. He says, he says, man, he says, I play those games all the time and I have never connected them to any sort of reality of what's going on in the world. And I will never play them again. You know, that kind of thing. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, Whoa. like the work is reaching, you know. And you know, the, and, so it, it's it's something that I think is kind of fascinating. And, and you know, Nathan and I were actually talking about this earlier today. Is that one of the things when you live in somewhere like Reno or even just to a certain extent somewhere like Milwaukee or you're outside of these kind of art centers. I I found myself in some ways migrating from the internet because it's was like the venue I had. You know, this was this was where I could I could use my voice, my intellect, my concepts, and kind of get my work out in a way that the art world is not particularly interested in art politics anyway. You know, that just is like doing it on my own terms, which is was something very, very rewarding. And I've kind of sort of kept to that path that I've said since then. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah. You mentioned you were so enamored with Gandhi, you walk when he walked, you wrestled when he wrestled. Um, you didn't fast like he did, did you? Oh my god, I hate so much. <laughs> 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 I was like, no, I was like, and, and reading about Gandhi, like, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but it's pretty amazing what he would do. And, and a few things related to that. Like, I was, I, I actually, I forgot to mention, I actually lost eight pounds. Um, but I, I literally, I literally, my life surrounded that project when I was doing it. And I, I would sleep, I would get up, I would eat, I would walk, I would come home, I would eat mostly pasta, go to sleep the next day, go in, you know, nothing else in my life mattered doing that. And um, it, was, it was completely absorbing and, and, and quite fascinating. So I, I mean, I, you know, that, that yeah, I, I, it's, it's a hybrid, and I, you know, I think if I had passed it, I probably would have really fallen off the curve. So I, I that, so it was this kind of weird hybrid experience, but it, it was your other party. What's that? Did your avatar eat? Um, somebody, no, people would give him food, though. Um, people would actually give him, like, there were people who would give him an apple. So he has like, he had a whole bunch of gifts by the end of the day. Um, but the, um, uh, I just forgot what I was going to say, but I'll remember if it was related to the question. But, um, the, it, it was fascinating. And, and I, I, part, of, part of my interest in that project as well was exploring um, what it means to develop an avatar. Like mm -hmm. the thing about second life that they use in their average is like, do anything, do anything. So people are, you know, all kinds of things in there. But there's something really, to me, very, it was like, okay, if you could be all these things, why can't you be this? Why can't I, as a middle-aged white guy, be gone? I mean, there's something, you know, from my, when I was in grad school, it was in the 80s, and identity politics, and, you know, feminist theory, and all those kind of things was sort of swimming in that. To do what I was doing, like, when did shop, you know, it was like, me playing this person, you know? But that was part of what they did with them. I didn't ask. But you still gained a lot of insight of Gandhi. Did you feel like you, you said that you started to see people and you feel like see bubbles instead of talking to people? And you didn't like, I know you didn't become Gandhi, but in retrospect, do you think you learned why, like, you almost like walked in his footsteps pretty much? Well, I, 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 when I say that it changed me, mm -hmm. I am really serious. Like, I'm not as, I'm much more relaxed since that experience. Um, don't get upset as easily as I used to. I mean, there was something, and, and I really felt, I mean, I'm, I've never done that kind of thing like people walking across, you know, doing, doing a walk across the United States or one of those kind of like marches for this and all that. Um, I really felt like I accomplished it. When I finished that 240 mile, I, it just was, there was something fulfilling in my experience. But uh, a curious thing that happened this is really fun. Um, so in the midst of doing all of this, uh, Philip Glass, uh, his opera, The, the, the Satyagraha, was being reproduced at the Metropolitan uh, 
computer. And this was all in all the newspapers and all that. And literally the day after I finished the march, they had a series of four marches from different points in New York City going to Union Square. The Gandhi march, like a like a peace march. And I was like, oh I gotta I gotta go do this. And what was really interesting is I'm actually a very shy person and kind of in person in Second Life as Gandhi. I'm like, hey, how are you doing? Like, hey, you know, like this like, total interaction. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna do it. And so I went, there was a group meeting by the Whole Foods in the Lower East Side. That was the start of this one leg of it. And I remember walking down, I'm like, I didn't talk to anyone. I was like, totally just like, you know, like doing this sort of thing. And then I started walking along and started talking with people, filled the glass wave from this window and stuff. And, and it wasn't until about halfway through the march I actually started talking with some of the other people. And, and, and it was interesting because it was part of the ideation process about the giant Gandhi was the, uh, the puppeteers who were doing the salt stuff to grow out, who also ended up doing the, the horse for the war horse play, if any of you have seen that. They were, they were these, these English guys walking along and started talking about what I had just finished. And they were, they were it's like, you know, you da -da -da. And their, pu their puppets were these giant paper mache figures that were part of the play. And that, that was part of the ideation process, which I think was just kind of interesting. Uh, questions? Uh, yes. I noticed that um, your works that exist outside of the digital realm are taken from the digital realm. And um, I guess as as such, um, I'm curious a little bit about your like ideation process and sketching or planning out um, projects, how you approach that, if it's more uh, writing and research, or you know, actually, you mentioned that you hadn't physically drawn for 20 years, so I don't know if you do a lot of sketching. And, and I don't do a lot of sketching. My ideas are, I don't know, I'm constantly thinking if I do, um, I'm a road cyclist, so I do I, a lot of my best thinking when I'm out riding, and get in that sort of contemplative sort of state. Um, but a number of things about the ideation process. Um, this was I was talking with one of you grad students about um, Alan Raft yesterday. Uh, he's a very interesting Bay Area artist that I met when I was a student, the uh, main friends. But I interviewed him for a graduate class, and one of the smartest things he ever told me, which really stuck with me. I asked him, I said, well, what artists are you interested in? What are you, like, what are you looking at? And he said, he said, you know, he says, he says, I don't read art magazines. I said, you know, you read art magazines, you make work that looks like art magazine art. You know, and he says, he says, I read popular mechanics, I read popular science, I read, you know, it's like, and, and I think there's something really genuinely interesting <laughs> to really absorb yourself in the culture. Like, like, look at things other than, other than art. Part of that also, like if um, if you've ever read the wonderful book, Alan Capra's essays uh, on art and life, I'm screwing up the title here. But one of the things he talks about is um, art that art that is truly experimental. You generally don't know that it's art when you're doing it because it is experimental, right? I mean, if it if it looks like something you've seen before, or if it's you know, you know, and that and that like that Howell thing was just like something like. It's like, this is really stupid, but I gotta do this. <laughs> right? And then it lands up being something interesting. And, and actually, curiously, that Howell thing was this good example of that. Like, so when I, that was, that was done on my first sabbatical. And I remember going into sabbatical, and I was like, before I was buying like all of these books <laughs> of art theory and all this like really media arts theory and all those kind of things, and I got on sabbatical, and I was like, <laughs> serving science fiction, biographies, like all this kind of stuff. And one of the biographies I read was a biography of Andy Kaufman. And if you remember Andy Kaufman, one of his famous, one of his, I think he's a performance artist, not a comedian, but one of his famous performances was a verbatim reading of The Great Gatsby, where he would basically sit on stage and read the entire thing, at, like at a, at a university setting. You know, that kind of thing, just, it just was like, oh, brilliant. Uh, and the other big inspiration, as far as like those reenactments, was uh, Monty Python, the, the sketch they do with the women, something or other guild that reenacts Pearl Harbor. You know what I'm talking about? And it's just basic old ladies in a mud field bashing each other. <laughs> you know, those that stuff inspired me. Um, you know, and I love I love 
bad science fiction. I love, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, it, I get my ideas and, and more so from these kind of things. And, and living in a place like Reno, it's really twisted, you know. And, and, uh, the casinos are, when I moved to Reno, it was like, walking into a casino was like, my God, this is like every depiction of virtual reality I've ever seen. So, I mean, you know, you start looking, Reno, it's hard to identify, it's hard to really kind of pin this down, but Reno is one of these places where you really feel like people don't belong here, just in terms of the physical environment. It's this harsh desert environment that we're forcing it, like Las Vegas, to allow us to live there. And so it feels kind of pretend. And so all this stuff <coughs> infects my thinking. Um, I do write, I, I have an idea book, but it's very, very short little bits. I can do this idea, this idea, and then one thing will lead to another. Um, I have lately actually been just finished writing. Uh, I'm not a scholar like, like Nathan, but uh, I have. A, there's a book chapter I wrote for a book. Uh, I can't remember the name of the book, but it is called The Gandhi Complex. And it's all about that one. And there's a more recent one called Playing Politics for a book on Nash Vishnu that's coming out this year. Um, and I have written about the uh, I write more of the as well. But it, it's really get your head out of art.